unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Now, I want you to really understand, I did not know about this paper. God, she, this comes in a, in a brown paper wrapping. It was not unwrapped at my home. I did not see this. The title is An Earnest Warning About Lukewarmness. God's trying to tell us something. I didn't get one amen. Thank you. I got two. <laughs> Three. Praise God. I want to share it with you from God's word this morning. The title of my message this morning is It's Not God's Fault. It's not God's fault. I want you to open up your Bibles, please. And while you're doing that, I just want to say that I had the the honor of being at Christopher Roy's funeral yesterday in Worcester, the firefighter that lost his life. He was 36 years old, I believe, or 32. 36 years old, had a, a single parent, daughter of nine years old. And um, he was, uh, they were called to a fire in Worcester, and he went into the building, and uh, never, he never got out fast enough. And they went and got him and brought him to the hospital, but he passed away. And there were several hundred, if not thousands, of firefighters, and uh, it was just a very sad time, and uh, we had a delegation from the Fayetteville Fire Department that went up, and I went up yesterday, spent a good part of the day up there in Worcester. And um, so please keep his family in prayer. This little girl, nine years old, now has no parent. And... Uh, just pray that God would somehow reach her, and touch her, and, and save her, and that somehow that she'll be put in a Christian home. Amen? Praise God. All that I said this morning was not planned, and, and all that came out of my heart. But, you know, I talk to some pastors, and they, they tell me how their congregation, you know, they call they call them and they ask for prayer and they call them when they're sick and they call them. None of you do that with me. In fact, very few of you ever call me just to see how I am. Hello? Yet I'm your pastor. Very few of you, when you're going through difficulties, call me and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? but yet you call me your pastor. Am I? Am I your pastor? Do you hide your problems because you don't want pastor to know about them? Do you hide through facades and make-believe so that pastor will think good of you? But yet I'm your pastor. Can I tell you, if you think I don't know, I do. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is real, and he speaks. He speaks things in secret in my heart about you, and I never mention it. Because I want God to do it. I want God to speak to you. You can come with me at a smile and a hug, and, and that's all great. I love those. But God knows. I want to speak to you this morning on it's not God's fault. And, I, and you know, as we were thinking about this firefighter, you know, and these tragedies that happen in life, and understand that they happen to Christians too. And a lot of times I hear people say, why couldn't God prevent that? He's God. He's He's powerful. Why couldn't he stop that? When tragedy hits, and I've heard testimonies of firefighters that miraculously got out of burning buildings, unbeknownst to them, which resulted in conversion. But why can't God, or why doesn't God, do something about it? And as I was thinking about that, 
God the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I had already done something about it. So if you have your Bibles, open up with me, please, to the book of Genesis. I'm going to start looking in verse, chapter 2, verse 15, if you will, please. There are several people missing this morning. And I know that some are going to leave this church. I already know that. How do I know that? I know it in the spirit. Is it God's will? Maybe for some, maybe not for some. But God is not responsible for not interacting at the time when you and I think he should. Starting with verse 15, it says, And the Lord took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Man had a responsibility. Say that word with me, responsibility. God always, when he introduced man, didn't let man just kind of float along. Adam had this relationship with God and God with Adam and they could correspond back and forth and they could talk to one another. In fact, the Bible says that he walked in the cool of the garden. But just because he had a relationship with God did not mean that God didn't put any responsibility on Adam. From the very beginning of man, God gave man something they needed to do. Amen? You say, Pastor, you, 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 you prepared all of this. No, I had nothing for you this morning. I'm being honest with you. This is what God put in my heart this morning. I didn't have all week to prepare this because I, I was, God just didn't give me anything. So what I'm giving you this morning is from the Holy Ghost. God took the man, he put him in the garden and Eden, and he said, you dress it and you keep it. You are responsible for the upkeep of the garden. You are responsible for the place that you and I are going to fellowship. You and I are going to have interaction. You and I are going to be fellowshipping with one another. But in that fellowship, in that time together, there is something that you need to do. You need to dress it. You need to keep it. God says for you and I that we need to dress ourselves in the robe of his righteousness. God says that we have to put off the old man, put on the new man. We have to dress it and we have to keep it. Not just dress it and throw it aside. Not just take it off and say, okay, now I can go back to the way things were. Because let me tell you. There is an underlining. We're doing a study on Wednesday nights about the one world order. It is fast approaching, my friend. But it's because we've been lulled to sleep by the enemy. Many times God warned Jeremiah. He warned the prophets about them falling asleep his watchmen falling asleep. Can I tell you today, there are pastors that have fallen asleep and their only concern is success and wealth and prosperity and making you feel good. They've fallen asleep. 
before God poured out the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, when they were all in the upper room, Before that came, hallelujah, the reason why you and I enjoy the gifts of the Spirit, the reason why you and I enjoy the things of the Spirit, the reason why we enjoy His Holy Spirit and His presence is because of the book of Acts. He said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. But that didn't just come. If you read in the book of Joel in the Old Testament, what was the first thing God told him? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Sound the alarm. Do you know how many people, how many people perish in fires because they don't have smoke alarms in their home? And their fire, while they're sleeping, there's fires that start sometimes in the basement, sometimes in the kitchen, wherever it may be. And the house fills with smoke. And because there's no alarm, many have lost their lives. Because people don't put the importance about of alarms. Hallelujah. Even some of us in the morning when we have our alarm clocks, what do we do? We hit the snooze. Give me just five more minutes. Give me just ten more minutes. And then you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off because you're running late because something else happened and something else came that you weren't expecting. But Joel said, sound the alarm in my holy mountain. And then after that, after the warning, after the, the, the trumpet blowing and getting people's attention, that's what it was. When they blowed the shofar horn, it was to get people's attention. And once they had the attention, then God said, behold, there comes a day when I will go and pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Come on, somebody. But the warning had to come first. The trumpet had to blow first. And the Lord God, verse 16, commanded man. Under this dispensation of grace today, so many people disregard the commandments of God. God commanded the very first man who had relationship with him, who walked with him. How many would like to walk with God in a garden? Feel his presence all the time. Feel him near you all the time. That's what Adam had. There was no disconnect with God. Wow. Wow. No disconnect with God. They were connected through fellowship. He told God, commanded. Now let me just back up for a moment and say this. When God created Adam, he created Adam and gave him a gift. Do you know what that gift was? Anybody have an idea what that gift was besides life? Huh? No, that's not a gift. That's a talent. The gift that he gave him was the gift of choice. God gave Adam the gift of choice. How many know that I can't say that because it's not politically correct. God doesn't take back his gift. In fact, the Bible says the gift of God is irrevocable. God gave Adam the gift of choice. 
If you read everywhere in the Bible, you'll see God says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. You choose. Why? Because that's the origination that I created man to have is the choice. So he commands the man and he says, of every tree, Adam, look around you. Look at all the trees that I've created in this garden. Adam, you can have and you can eat, you can partake of every single tree in this garden. I know I'm driving Bobby crazy by walking all over the place. <laughs> he says, you can eat of any garden you choose. But Adam, I've got to do this. In order for you to have the legitimacy of having a choice, you've also got to have the ability to not choose. And so he says in the next verse, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. When God spoke that to me this morning, and in the, in the other day too, when I asked him the question, why is it all these things happen? Why could, can't you prevent some of these things? He said, I already did, right here. What you see today, the calamity that you see today, the things that you see today are a result of the choice of man. We can never question God and say, God, why don't you do something? He already did. He created all of those trees, and man could have chosen from all those because he was a free will. He had the choice, but Adam chose to disobey God. What you see of the suffering of cancer and tumors and people dying is not a result of an unmerciful, unkind God. How many know that God can't go back on his word? He gave you a gift. And can I tell you, man today is still defiling that gift. God gives us commandments in his word. And he says, I want to prosper you. I want to bless you. I want, you to, I want to, um, make and let you be happy in life. The Bible says, whatsoever therefore a man sows, he shall also reap. Are you hearing me? When you sow something, you made a choice. I tell young people when I talk to them, and, I, and if I'm talking with them, I tell them this. Listen, if you have losers for friends, you will become a loser. If you hang around with those that do drugs, and, and eventually you'll do drugs. You hang around those that will drink and fall over and be alcoholic, you will be just like them. Don't think in your pride and arrogance you can escape that. I know there are people that I know personally that have struggled with second, third, fourth generation alcoholics. Their grandfather was an alcoholic, their father was an alcoholic, their mothers are alcoholic, their grandmothers are alcoholic, and they're an alcoholic. And they can't get loose. You know why? Because of choice. Not because God doesn't want to deliver them. I can tell you, I drank every day, took drugs every day, had hair down here. I went the hippie scene. I was... I was uh, involved in all kind of sexual relationships. But let me tell you something. When God gets a hold of the human heart, 
and you're willing to obey him, he can change your course of direction and life forever. I'm living proof of it. But it's your choice. You can heed to what I'm telling you this morning. Maybe some of you will leave this place. And you know what? You'll go do this. You just do this. You shrug it off. You know how I know that? Because you don't change. If you do this, God sees it. But again, that's your choice. But when things start to tumble away and things start to fall away in your life, when you no longer read the Bible anymore, when you ain't got no time for the Bible, you ain't got no time for church, you ain't got no time for this, you ain't got no, who do you think is the robber of time? Good lungs. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat, you're going to die. You're going to die. In the day that you eat, you're going to die. Can I tell you something? Even with the strictest warning to people, they still have a choice. They're choosing. He chose. Now see, sometimes men say, see, it was the woman. No, 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 no. He had a choice. Just like she had a choice. God said out of all these, do you know that he could have taken from the tree of everlasting life? And if he would have ate that tree first, it would have been utopia on earth. There'd be no sin. There'd be no, no evil that could touch a human being. But because of choice, hear me now, because of choice, Adam and Eve were cast out of that garden. They're the responsible ones. They disobeyed God. God gave them a choice. You said, well, God could have made them. No, God won't make you. How can I make you? In fact, the Bible says, if you being righteous see a wicked man and you do not warn him, of his wicked ways. He will die in his sin. Now listen to this. But his blood will be required at your hand. God's going to require someone else. Yes. Hear it again. He said if you're righteous and you see a wicked person. And you don't warn that wicked person of their ways. When they die. Their blood will be on your hands. Why? Why? Why should I be responsible for someone else? Can I tell you something, please? And, and I'm not trying to badger any other church. Believe me, I'm not trying to do that. But what do you hear from a lot of the pulpits today? Don't judge. Don't point out someone's sin. Don't tell them that they're on their way to hell. <laughs> Don't do that. You'll lose people. I'd rather lose people speaking the truth and stand before God and they say, and God says, well, their blood is not on your hands. You've won them. You've told them. Because it's up to them. It's their choice. I can't make anybody believe. I can't make any of you come to church. That's your choice. I can't make you do anything. I can talk to you till you're blue in the face. I can give you advice. I can give you counsel. And you can go right out there and do just the opposite. 
but you will reap what you sow. The suffering you go through sometimes in life, today. You may ask the question, well, I'm a Christian now. How come, how come God doesn't straighten everything out? Because you need to go through the process. What you sowed is bringing fruit today. Let me give you an example. Guy before is a Christian. Has a bad family life, has bad relationship, father beats him, whatever it may be. He has so much pent up anger in him. He goes and he takes drugs and he drinks and his lifestyle is just ter- falling apart. And one day he decides he needs to go out and get money because he needs to take drugs and he robs a store. And he shoots and kills the owner of the store. And he, the police catch him and he is sentenced to life in prison. And then during that prison time, he gets to become a Christian. Does the accountability and responsibility go away because he's a Christian? No. He's still in prison. Now, sometimes God, for whatever reason, maybe his vocation or calling, whatever, God will give favor. That person will come out and turn and help people and do all kinds of things. But that's just the exception to the rule. That's not the rule. What you sow in life, if you want to be successful in life, if you want to just go through life, if I can say this over here, working in a factory, and work in a factory, and work in a factory, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But if you have aspirations, you have dreams, and you want to get from one place to another, I remember when my friend Joe worked at, uh, uh, what was the place you worked at? Aravox. And man, I always just look up to Joe and say, man, this guy's going to be a scientist or something, you know? I mean, he won the science project in, was it, sixth grade? In sixth grade, he won a trip to Washington, D.C., and they, they took him and I think it was somebody else, wasn't it? Yeah, took them to, to Washington. They went on a free trip and all that stuff. I said, man, that guy, he's going to be a scientist or something. But because of choices and circumstances and situations and relationships and things that went sour in his life, he had to take a job at Aravox. One thing I knew about Joe, he wouldn't be happy at Aerobox. He used that as a stepping stone. He didn't say, well, this is my plight in life. I've got to work at a factory. No, he applied himself, and he put himself in positions. And he went to places where there was free food. <laughs> That's the truth. And he got himself involved in a job in Harvard. And then he took classes in Harvard. He's a physics major. And he's still learning. And today, he's vice president, associate vice president in a bank. He was not happy because he made the right choices. Yes. Yeah. Yes, opportunities that God gave him in some kind of awful situations. Okay. One of them was leaving Cambridge, humbling himself, getting out of the sinking boat he was in. Was it three years ago? Four, three or four years, maybe? He was bankrupt. Brand new Mercedes. His own business, intelligent something or other. Huh? Decisive information, intelligence, business he had. He'd go to business and do anal- analysis and all stuff and how to be successful in business. But then something happened. His choices began to catch up with him. See, because when years ago I told him, Jesus loves you, Joe. Jesus wants your life, Joe. We prayed for Joe. Guess what? 
God is after Joe, and now there's nothing in this world that is more important. So God began to allow the enemy to take away the possessions, take away his security, take away all that he was so that he can be all he is. Hear me now. God will take away all that you are so that you can be all that he wants you to be. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. And you can put on credit and still go. Pfft. But look what he has now. If you look over the life, and I knew that he was going to live in Vicky's house before that apartment was even available. Didn't I tell you? I said, that woman's going to move out, and it's, it's just a matter of God's timing. You can't preach. Let me preach. And, and, <laughs> and he's going to move that woman out in time, and God's going to have the right time when you have the job and you have money that you can afford that apartment. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Yeah, I told him from the very beginning, mechanics cooperative bank. And he said, no, no. So he went and got some experience again on the bus, driving to Boston every single day for two and a half years or whatever it was. And then he gets a call. Guess from where? <laughs> mechanics cooperative bank. Hello? So Adam, let me get back to my story. So Adam here says, God says to Adam, you shall not eat of it. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And look at, the, look at how man twists what God does. God gives him a help meet. Puts Adam to sleep. Can I tell you, this is the first surgery you ever see in the Bible. This is the first procedure, sur surgical procedure you ever see in, on earth. God takes, Adam puts him to sleep, anesthesia. Okay? That's why he's the great physician. He opens up Adam, takes out the rib, and if you look, it says he sewed him up. That's right. God performed the first surgical operation. So out of that, he created Eve. And they were to rule together in this garden because it was not good that man should be alone. Come on. So wives, and also let me just say this too. The Bible says that God spoke this to Adam about the trees. It never says that God spoke to the woman about the trees. Are you hearing me? God spoke to the man and the man spoke to the woman. It was Adam who taught his wife Eve what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. Now watch this. Ladies, I want you to listen. Please pay attention. The one thing that the devil hates, and I remember being at a women's conference. You remember that? In uh, uh, New York. Okay. Where was that in New York? And of what was the Long Island? It was on Long Island, New York. I had dro dro drove my wife up to Long Island, New York for a women's conference, and I didn't want to drive all the way back home, so I stayed and I sat in the back. And the woman got up to share, and she says, "I want to first say this: uh, that uh, my subject today is going to be on women and submission." No word of a lie. The whole audience went, "Oh!" <gasps> Remember? They don't like that word. From the very time in the garden, the woman chose to listen to someone else other than their husband. 
Hello? Come on. Now, that doesn't mean if your husband is a goofball, okay, and over time has made stupid decision after stupid decision, God is not expecting you to make the same stupid decision. God wants you to submit to your husband. However, if your husband is taking you out of the will of God, no. You've got to obey God rather than man. If you miss Wednesday's Bible study, you miss something. About the new world order that's coming and how they're going to use the Bible to exert their authority. Well, the Bible says that those that are, you know, of the government are for your good, to obey them. And if you don't, you're in, you're in conflict with God's word. And then I said, but they don't read the other part that says, I'd rather obey God than man. That's why you've got to know your Bible. You eat of it, the day you eat of it, you're going to die. So what does Eve do? Eve starts wandering out on her own. Choices. And she's in the garden, and all of a sudden this serpent comes. It starts to talk to her. And she says, oh, we can eat of all the trees of the garden, but of this tree we cannot eat. And then she did something else. Naughty, naughty, naughty. She added to the word. She says, you cannot eat of it, and you cannot touch it. I just read to you, God didn't say anything about touching it. Hello? When she added to the word, the enemy said to her, no, God knows he's holding something back from you. Well, how did she know what God's will was? It was her husband. God spoke to the husband. The husband spoke to the woman. So indirectly, what the enemy was saying is, don't listen to your husband. So she listened to the serpent. And the Bible says that Eve took of the tree, and she held it in her hand. And she ate it. It says, and then she gave it to her husband, and he did eat it. Well, why did he eat it? Did he believe his wife over God? Most likely. Because she touched it, nothing happened. And he touched it, nothing happened. What you do in life, you cannot blame your father, you cannot blame your mother, you cannot blame your brothers or your sisters or your family. It's your decision. It's your choice. What your choices, the choices you make today is going to determine your choices in the future. What you are today is what you're going to be in the future. That's why if you choose... If you have a goal, I tell people all the time, get a goal. What's your goal in life? What do you want to be in life? What do you want to do? Oh, I just want to sit around and smoke weed all day. Guess what? You're going to just smoke around, you're going to just sit around and smoke weed till whatever. Or go out drinking and partying when you should be studying. And then you fail school and the school kicks you out because you failed. But that's not because of the school and it's not because of anything else but your choices. In life, what you believe. You go to school and you begin to study and study. And then the devil comes and says, oh, you'll never pass that. You'll never make it. You're too stupid. You can't be that stupid. You made it that far. And you believe the lie. And he robs you of your vocation of what God really has for you. And you settle. Not only do you settle in your vocation, you settle in your life. How many people married the wrong person simply because that person accepted them and they felt that no one else would accept them? Come on, somebody. That happens every time. 
They settle in their relationships. And then years later, they suffer. They only knew God at that time and knew his word. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're the only one like it. God loved you so much that he molded you just to, for you, and he broke the cast. There's no one that has your fingerprints. There's no one that has your eye, your eye formation. That's why they use an eye recognition today. No one has your DNA. You're unique in and of yourself. And here, God chooses them gives, them, gives them the ability to choose. If I can just use the terminology to say 50. I like 50 because the year of Jubilee. 50 is the year of Jubilee. I'd say there was 50 trees in that garden. I don't know how many there were, so don't hold it to me. But 50 trees in that garden. And out of one, God says, don't eat it. Why? Why would that disobedience of eating that thing, me taking that thing, and the, why would that cause me to die? Number one, it's because it's rooted and grounded in rebellion. Who was the first one to rebel? Satan, Lucifer. He was the archangel of heaven that breathed out music. That was his ministry in heaven, was music. He'd breathe out worship to God until pride was found in him and he was cast out. He rebelled against God and he took a third of the angels with him. Now what happens? When we disobey God, we're rebelling. Do you understand that God knows what's best for you and he knew what was best for Adam. He knew what was best for Eve. He said, don't eat of it, because the day you eat of it, you're gonna, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you're going to see the evil. You're going to experience the evil. It's going to be a part of your life, and it's going to open up the door for you to see what the devil is doing. And rather than obey, Rather than obey, they chose to do what they wanted to do. Can I tell you the results of abortion today? The doctors are responsible. But the main reason is because people choose. People choose to have relationships out of marriage. And when they get pregnant, they don't want what I said. We're all going to say this word together. Responsibility for their actions. And so what they do is they figure, well, let's get rid of it. What they're saying is let's get rid of the responsibility. I'm a grown up enough to have sexual intercourse and, to, and get pregnant, but I'm not old enough to be responsible for it, then you shouldn't be doing that in the first place. Hello? Being responsible for your choice. Being responsible saying, God knows everything. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. When you want to make a decision... Go to God and ask him, say, God, what do you think of this? And you start to read his word, and he goes, ooh. Hmm. It says not to do that. And you go ahead and do it anyway. You reap the consequence. And then you, then you cry, oh, God, why, could, oh God, why did I got to go through this now? Because you chose to. One thing that is the most important, does God love you even though you made a mistake? Yes. Is he, is he going to correct you? Yes. Is he going to discipline you? Yes. Any father or mother that doesn't discipline you doesn't love you. If they just let you go on your own way, make your own decisions, you're not even old enough to drive a car. 
You're not, you're not even old enough to, to fend for yourself in life. And yet parents are making, letting their kids make choices that they have no business making. They're not old enough. They don't have the maturity enough. Well, Pastor, I want them to make their own mistakes. No! So you want them to drive drunk and kill somebody so they can learn a lesson? Do you want them to shoot a needle with opioid in it and overdose and die so they can learn a lesson? That's stupid. Go to God. What does he say? Make the right choice. Can I tell you, I know somebody used to come to this church, don't come anymore, that said they hated their expurlative mother and father. Hated them. Was talking to someone on Facebook or Messenger, whatever it was, and somebody from this church took it and took a picture of it and copied and printed it out and showed it to me. I never told the parents because I never wanted to hurt them. It was so awful. And yet these parents did everything for their child. The Bible says, honor your mother. Yeah, but my mother, she's a drug addict. My mother does this. My father does that. He's an alcoholic. True. But you honor them. How do you honor them? How can I honor an abusive father? You don't hold any grudges in your heart. You don't have to be with them. You don't have to participate with them. But in your heart, you don't dishonor them in front of other people. In your heart, you let it go. Come on, somebody. Making the right choices. God wants you to make those right choices. And it's not God's fault. Say it with me. It's not God's fault. He created a way for you and I. He wants us. He wants us. Do you know how many people I see go through red lights? It's terrible. I'm always cautious. When I, when I approach, I approach, I always kind of go slow and make sure I look because there's a bunch of quacks out there. And they'll go right through a red light. And think nothing of it. I was on Route 18 and uh, I don't know what this other street comes out from the projects down by the wharfs there. And there's a lane that you can take a left turn. And I was the first car here. This car from behind me, had, we had a red light all the way around. Green light this way. Goes right in, passes me on that lane. And instead of going right, he cuts back into this lane. So uh, I'm in my car. This was a while back. And I go up to the next set of lights, which is um, uh, the end of 18. And I pull up beside him. And I, I roll my window down. I said, and he rolls his window down, and I take my badge, and I show it to him. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, what are you doing? See, constables, I'm a constable. Constables have rights with traffic, too, because we're, we're keepers of peace and safety. He said, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, you went through that red light. I said, I was right there, the car right next to you. You could have killed somebody. I said, you need to take responsibility and accountability for yourself. <laughs> the reason why we have so many homes that are broken is because the fathers don't take responsibility for their children. That's why the welfare situation is so taxed because of choice 
Now, this all fits in because God was speaking to us today about the warning of lukewarmness. Turn with me to Revelation for a moment. Revelation chapter 3, I believe. Verse 14. I was thirsty and no one gave me to drink. Oh, I'm okay. I'll be all right. That was a joke. <laughs> I went to get some water and there was nothing. So I said, I was thirsty and no one gave me to drink. <clears throat> and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, the angel was a code word for messenger. John was on the Isle of Patmos, remember? He was... Boiled in oil, think about this. He was boiled in a pot of oil, hot oil, and he didn't die. So they said, what are we going to do with this guy? He's all red now. <laughs> Skin's all peeling off his body. Let's throw him on the island of Patmos. He'll surely die there. But he didn't. And in that time of pain and suffering, understand this. Here comes my son. Look at this. What a guy. Come on up here. Put that right over there for me. What a guy, huh? Thank you. I don't get no respect, you know what I mean? <laughs> Some of you young people don't know who that was. Yeah. <laughs> no respect at all, you know what I mean? You know you're getting old when you walk by a cemetery and two people with shovels chase you. And the angel of the church <laughs> of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Isn't that something? I'm preaching out of Genesis, and now look at this. The beginning of the creation of God. We spoke from Genesis, the creation of God. Now we're going into Revelation for a moment. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Look at what he says. Verse 15. I know thy works, that you are neither hot nor cold. Can you put that in the NLT for me? Or the HO? Give it to me in the Holman. Yeah, that's the one. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. In other words, he's saying, be either one. Be either one. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be stagnant. You know, if you see a, a, a brook with trout, you go see the trout runs. You know the ones that are stationary are actually moving backwards? The current takes you back. If you're, in, if, you're, if, you're in a, if you're in a river and you're on a surfboard or you're in a boat and you're not paddling and the river's current, you can be stationary in that boat, but you're going backwards. He says, be the heart of cold. Don't be lukewarm with the things of God. Next what he says, next verse. Now, this is Jesus speaking now. This is Jesus, okay? So because you are lukewarm and neither heart or cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. An earnest warning about lukewarmness. What I spoke this morning, I believe, was from God to tell you it's time to wake up. It's time to not be slumbering. It's time to not be lukewarm. Don't fall into that category of lukewarmness. Well, you don't understand. Yes, I understand. But, yeah, I understand. But, yeah, I understand. But you don't I, I, Yes, I do. You have a choice. What you choose 
is going to determine how far you go with Christ. What you choose to do, and believe me, the pressure can get tough. It can. My father When I was first a Christian, I used to play keyboard in nightclubs. That's what I did for a living. I used to play all the, then, all of the nightclubs in the area. I used to do weddings, all that kind of stuff. When I came to Jesus and I gave my life to him, God told me I had to quit that job. I could no longer play in a nightclub. Isn't this something how the Holy Spirit tells me that, but doesn't tell all these Hollywood stars they got to stop uh, doing soap operas? They can continue in their music, in their worldly music, they can continue. I don't know if that's Holy Ghost or not. He told me, you need to get out from among them. Touch not the unclean thing. When I did that and I, I went home and told my dad, because my dad was very instrumental in getting me to play. i never forget my father's words. He said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to serve God. He said, and you're not going to play in the nightclubs anymore? You're wasting your life away. That's what he told me. You're, you're going you're gonna to waste your life. So I had to make a choice. Do I listen to my dad and continue in the nightclubs, or do I listen to my heavenly father and listen to the nightclub, you know, and, 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 and leave the nightclub? So I struggle with that. Have any of you ever struggled with decisions? I struggle with that decision. And I was playing in the nightclub, and I, I was saying, God, I know you want me out of here. God, but you got to show me. And you have to understand, okay, when I took over for the gentleman that used to play there, on Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturday, and Sunday nights, I, my band packed that place out. It was standing room only. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just telling you that's the truth. But then when I got saved, hear me now. Okay, this is a true story, I'm telling you. When I got saved, I started to, I still was playing in the nightclub. Because, see, God wouldn't tell me to get out if I wasn't out. I was still there. God says, you need to leave there. And I struggled with that decision, you know, because that was my only livelihood. I had just bought my Super Brava Fiat. Brand new off the showroom floor. Five-speed. $78 a month. <laughs> and I had that, you know, I had that bills, and, and I said, God, what, what am I going to do? And I, I said, God, I understand. When I got saved, I told you, every single person in my family got a letter from me telling me to repent of going to hell. I wrote them a letter, sent every one of them a letter. I didn't hear from them, many of them. For, still haven't heard from many of them. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but that's what I did. I had such a zeal. I wanted to see them get saved, you know. And so uh, what I was doing is on my breaks, people are sitting there drinking their, you know, near, with their girlfriends and their wives at home and all this stuff. I'm going to say, do you know the Lord? No, Jesus loves you. Here's a track. Here, it tells you all about Jesus. They thought I was crazy. But little by little, Wednesday night started to dwindle. Friday night started to dwindle. Saturday night started to dwindle. They, they, they weren't there. Sunday night started to dwindle. In fact, one time I was playing, and um, after I was going on my break, and a person came up to me and said, what happened to you? I said, what do you mean? They said, something happened to you. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, your music. 
He said, you used to have a drive to your music, and it's gone. Oh, yeah. There was worldliness to my music. But when I got saved, he said, something's missing. You're missing that drive you used to have. So I would continue to play, continue to play, and day after day, and I said, Lord, when you're ready. And then on Wednesday nights, we had a grand total of <clears throat> 20 people. And I was on my break, and I was handing out tracks. And I remember, there was, I'll never forget this. There was a guy sitting at the bar, and uh, I felt to give him a track. So I gave him a track, and I slid over, and he said, what's that about? I said, it's about Jesus. He said, no, thank you. And he stood it back to me. As soon as he did, the Holy Ghost said, you're done. That night, the bartender said, we don't need you anymore. We're going to let you go. And that's when I left the nightclub business. I got into a church. And when the pastor found out I knew how to play an instrument, he didn't even give me time to enjoy the Holy Ghost. He said, get behind that piano. I didn't know a him from a her. You know the old hymns? I didn't know a him from a her. And I said, Pastor, I don't know any of these songs. I, I'm just new. I don't know any of these songs. He said, just listen. He said, if you have to play one note, play one note. So I sat there. He started playing. And that's what I did. Until you hear what you hear today. But it took obedience. I had to make that choice. And my father said, you're going to lose tons of money. So here I am, no job. You can't collect because, you know, they didn't have Social Security input into that. You had to take care of yourself, and I didn't. So here I was, jobless, moneyless, and a new car. And I said, God, now $78 to you ain't a lot of money today, but back then it was a lot of money in 78. And I went to church, and I sat on that piano, ding, 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 you know, learning the songs and everything, getting the flow of things. And, and I said, God, I hear the preacher saying, the pastor saying that God will meet my need. God, I'm new at this. I, I'm the new kid in the flock. I, I don't know anything. I mean, somebody got it. New kid in the flock. I said, God, I don't know any of this. But I, I, he said, you're going you're to meet my need. But God, my, my monthly... Payment is due Wednesday or whatever day. I'm just throwing a date. I don't remember. It was 40 years ago, whatever it was. My car, my car payment's due. So I get at the altar. That's what I'm telling you. This works. I got on the altar, and I cried out to God. I said, God, you know I need $78 for my car payment. And I got up from the altar, and I said, God, I don't know how how this is going to happen, but God, you got to come through. You told me to leave that job, and you said you provide all my needs. So we had a great Holy Ghost time. I went out to my car, and my window was open about this much. I usually left it open, you know, with the airflow and stuff. It was summertime. 
And I looked, there was an envelope on my seat. And on that envelope, it said these words, Praise Jesus. I get in my car, right? I sit down in my car. I got an envelope. What's this, you know? And I open it up. I start counting. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty-five, forty-five, fifty-five, sixty-five, seventy, seventy-five, eighty dollars. I said, wow. God, you're faithful. I didn't tell anybody either. I said, God, you're faithful. Next month rolled around. I said, God, you got another envelope? <laughs> you're laughing, but guess what? I went out after service, and guess what was on my seat? Another envelope with $80 in it. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. How many believe in miracles? You have your ring on? What, what, you don't take that ring off. I just want to give, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to give you a testimony. Put it on. You ringless thing, you. <laughs> no, come here. Come here. Isn't that a beautiful ring? Look at that ring, huh? Now, you look at that ring and you, say a, you see a ring, but you don't know there's a story behind that ring. Isn't it? It was my... Wife and I's first, fifth wedding anniversary. And remember, I quit the nightclub business, so I had no money. And I was home one day, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to, because we borrowed her mother's uh, diamond ring to get married. Remember that? And I said, Lord, I, I was praying, I said, Lord, I'd like to get her a ring someday, you know, of our own, you know. And so this day, the Lord spoke to me. He says, I want you to go to National Wholesale used to be on Hathaway Road. And I said, ah, let me try this other store. I went to the other store. They were like $1,000 and everything, whatever. So then finally I submitted to the Lord. I said, okay, I'm going to National Wholesale. I went to National Wholesale, and I saw this ring. And I said, ooh, how much is that ring? And they told me it was a little over $500. Now, you know, man, this was quite a while ago. And I had $20 in my pocket. And I said, I said, do you have a layaway? She, she said, yes. I said, what's the minimum I can put on this? She said, $20. So I reached in my pocket, $20, I put on there. And I was with my friend, Ed, Ed Aruda. I'll never forget this. Ed said, I'm going to believe God with you. I said, okay, good. So what happened was I put on a layaway, and I wanted it for our anniversary. Wasn't that right? And um, so one day, in my mailbox, there was, a, there was cash, $20. I said, ooh, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to put that on the ring. Whatever comes in, I'm going to put it on the ring, $20. Another time was $10. Another time somewhere, I got $15. And then I'm home one day, and we had a post office box for the ministry, you know. And the Lord said, go buy the post office box. Just go by the post office box. I go by the post office box. I open up. There's an envelope. Not mailed. Not mailed. There's an envelope in there. I take it home and I start counting it. $300. And guess what was written on the envelope? Praise Jesus. I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. I took that $300, ran down there. Man. Man. Now it was only a hundred bucks short, right? I had like four or five days to our anniversary. So there was a guy that was coming to our church at the time, and, and so he called me up. He said, hey, Pastor, how you doing with the ring? I've been praying for you and all that. I said, well, I said, I'm $100 short. My anniversary's coming up, but it's okay. If I don't give it to any anniversary, when I get the rest of the money, I'll do that. He said, okay, no problem. 
About an hour later, he calls me up. He says, he said, Pastor, he says, man, he says, Holy Ghost is driving me nuts. I said, what are you talking about? He said, the Holy Ghost is telling me to give you that extra $100 to pay it off. So he came and he gave me the $100 and I paid that ring off and we went out to dinner and I gave Linda this ring. And then she kept it for a while and then I had bought her another one uh, 15 years later, right? Something like that. And then these guys got married. <laughs> and God, and she's like my daughter, okay? And God spoke to Mama and said to give her that ring. That ring. That was a special ring. And she was worried about what I was going to think, but the Holy Ghost was already telling me to ask her. But I was afraid to ask her because she gets violent sometimes. <laughs> and I said, God, you got to speak to her first. So one day, I don't know, we were doing something, and she came up to me. She said, would you be offended or hurt if I gave Rebecca my ring? And I said, not at all. I said, because that's what God spoke to me. So when she looks at that ring, she knows that's a ring of love and of a miracle. Amen? Thank you, honey. But all of that I said this for a reason. Because it's up to choice. It's all up to choice. And someday, ask Mama about the ring I bought her in uh, St. Martin. And the whole story that that went around there. All because of her fault. I almost missed the boat because of her. <laughs> I'm serious. But anyway, praise God. So make the right choices. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be half committed, half baked. You're not that way with your job. Don't be that way with the things of God. Don't let the enemy rob you of your blessing when you go there before him. Don't let the things of this world, you know, I remember the time, and I'm just going to say this one more time. I'll close again. I know his preachers are famous for lying, but they say we're going to close and we don't. But this was one more thing. I remember when Joe came and he was telling me he's going to do skydiving. I was like, oh, God, please. <laughs> I said, God, don't. And he said, I'm, I'm going to skydiving. He went sky. He got video of it. You should bring the video in sometime. We'll play it over here. And he's flying through the air, goggles all over here, you know. No, I'm only kidding. But he went skydiving. He was going to start doing that. And I said, God, please. That's dangerous. Do something. And one day, the same place that he took lessons from, a very professional skydiver pulled the chute. Nothing happened. He died. Joe said, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> if a professional does that, I'm not doing it no more. <laughs> I said, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Don't put God in precarious positions to have to save you. <laughs> Amen. Can I get a good amen this morning? Did, did this help you this morning? I hope so. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. God bless you, those who are watching by Facebook. You know I'm crazy. But I love you all. And I love you because of the love of Christ. And I want to see the best that God has for you. Lord, I pray, God, set this church on fire. God, to be an instrument in your hands. Not just going with the flow, God. Not because there might be some more work involved, more sacrifice. Let us be willing to pay the price and say, God, it's a privilege to serve you. It's an honor to serve you. Now, I pray that everyone here will not be offended when they leave this place, but they'll be challenged 
to make the right choice. And will not fail to give you all the glory and honor. Lord, bless their going in, their coming out. They're lying down, they're rising up. Those who have nothing for Christmas, God, help us so that we can help them. Those that may need some gifts, let them know, let them speak, let them say. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. That's not, only, that's not only with you, God, in prayer, but that's also with people that may be wondering, how can I help someone, but no one ever says anything. So God, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We will not fail to give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Greet one another before you leave. Amen.